Hola a todos, buenas tardes. Eh, muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Estamos muy contentos de tener el día de hoy a Sharmila Parmanant eh, para hablarnos de las dimensiones éticas en los debates sobre grupos que, eh, marginados. Eh, today's conversation is going to be happening in English. And a las personas que quieran eh, escucharla en español, va a haber una eh, subsecuente transcripción de esta conferencia donde podrán leer los subtitulados but for the time being we're going to have uh, the rest of this conversation with Sharmila, with Sharmila in English and um, if any of you want to uh, make questions in Spanish I'll be happy to translate um, well let me just uh, say a few words about Sharmila and about why she's here uh, she is um, she has a PhD in in gender studies from from Cambridge from the University of Cambridge And she's been studying uh, sex trafficking uh, discourses and interventions in the Philippines. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, the, the ethical dimension, the dimensions of, of uh, uh, debates about marginalized groups. So uh, I'm very happy that uh, to introduce and give the our warm welcome to Sharmila. Hi, Sharmila. Welcome. the ethical dimensions of representing marginalized communities in debating. So I will be talking about debating as a representational practice, right? What does that mean? What are the stakes for us? Um, do we have any ethical responsibilities? So, uh -huh. and just as a, you know, to reinforce what was said, I used to be a competitive debater myself, and then I moved on to Um, coaching, judging, and I was also setting a lot of topics um, for tournaments. And, you know, that was over 15 years of my life, maybe more that I spent in debating, closer to 20. And there, this is partly my own way of looking back and reflecting on my engagement with the activity as well. And there are certainly some things I would have done better um, through the years in terms of topic setting or in terms of arguments that I have run or in terms of like how I coached my students. So this, this is a work in progress because this is a very difficult conversation to have, right? So there are four things I'll cover in this short talk and I would love to hear your comments and your lectures uh, and your questions and engage with those. Um, also just a side note, it is currently 4.30 a.m. where I am. <laughs> um, so apologies if I sound a little bit sleepy. So first, I'll establish that debating is a representational practice. Second, I'll talk about the exclusion of certain groups and communities from, from this practice, from the production of knowledge in general. And here I'll talk a bit more about sex workers in particular, because they are a group that I've worked with for my own research. And then I'll highlight, as a, after going through those two Uh, things I'll highlight the important things to consider when speaking about marginalized groups, again, with a focus on sex workers. And then I ask the question, how can we do better as uh, debaters, as a debating community? Can we actually do better? Uh, what are some of the things we will just have to live with, maybe? What are some of the dilemmas, right? And um, I want you to know that I'm not coming to this um, lecture with, you know, solutions to everything. There will be some tensions that only you can resolve in specific uh, contexts. But what I'm trying to do here is provide some guidance around how to make that et those ethical decisions, right? So this is more a, a, a tool for decision making rather than telling you what the decisions should be. Um, so what do I mean? when I say that debating is a representational practice, right? We are, in some ways, we are representing reality. We're talking about the world in debating. It requires us to identify um, problems and solutions. And we have a lot of intervention in the process of identifying the problem and the solution. So when we say the problem is this and not this, right? These are the key aspects of the problem. We are in some ways kind of recreating the world uh, and like um, providing knowledge about it. So it's, it's representing 
but uh, later on I'll talk about how representation is not a neutral act, right? It also requires us to make claims on behalf of and about certain groups. Because when you're in a debate, you don't really represent yourself and your own like individual interests and desires. You're usually like representing you know, the interests of specific groups or communities and you're saying it's good, a certain policy is good for them or it's bad for them, right? And so you're talking about what their interests are, what their values are, what their desires are, right? What their needs are. Um, and a lot of times we think this is a good thing because, you know, oh, this encourages us encourages us to think from different points of view, right? That's what we always tell uh, the kids we coach. And, and, you know, that's also why I fell in love with debating because it pushes me out of my comfort zone. It makes me th think hard about, oh, what would this look like from the perspective of someone who lived in China, for example? Or what would this look like from the perspective of an older person or uh, a, a Trump voter? And on an intellectual level, that is a, an, an exciting exercise, right? Like you can feel the, the mental stimulation. And I think in some ways, not completely, in terms of building you know, a mature political culture, it's helpful because it forces us to think about things um, from perspectives that we otherwise would not have considered. We would just be thinking about it from our own perspective, right? It also means that there is visibility for certain issues. Like we talk about certain issues that we otherwise would not have talked about in our ordinary lives. So for me, debating was when I first started learning in depth about, you know, the LGBT community, for example, or um, the, the, the possibility of not having a religion or secularism or being able to critique religious institutions. Um, some of these conversations or some of these groups, for example, are not things that are normally discussed in a standard curriculum or in a classroom. And especially for people like me who grew up in a, in a conservative country, debating provided that way of getting to know these people, these ways of thinking about the world. But, you know, now that I've had 20 years to think about that, I also ask myself, is visibility automatically a good thing, right? Is all visibility good visibility for marginalized groups? And the, the dilemma here is, you know, not all groups are easily knowable, as you have identified, right? And that's why we're having this conversation. Some groups are harder to get to know because their histories are not easily available in books, it's not taught in class. We only speak of them in, you know, very stereotypical ways. We're unlikely to encounter them in our daily lives. They aren't necessarily portrayed regularly on mainstream media, or if they are, they have no control over the production process, right? So it, some groups are harder to get to know than others. And these are groups that tend to be stigmatized communities on some level. So either they are, you know, economically marginalized or criminalized in some contexts or just like heavily disapproved of by society. So you're unlikely to meet someone who tells you, yeah, quite openly, I'm a sex worker, right? And then it's also important to recognize that all representation is partial and imperfect and not just in debating, in writing, um, in our research work, in the things we do as students, as scholars, as activists, right? And even more so in the case of debating, it's even, and this is something, again, I've realized it's worse in the case of debating, the kind of representation we, we do. Why? We have um, short prep time, right? We have 15 minutes in BP, we have 30 minutes for Australians and Asians and WSCC, and we're expected to like come up with a list of the needs of certain groups of people that we've possibly never met, right? Um, and talk about like what's good for them and what's going to make their lives better. We also have limited speaking time. We only have seven or eight minutes to do that. And we rarely belong to the groups that we are talking about, right? So the kind of representations we're making there are very are very imperfect. And we need we need to accept that, right? And if if 
you are under the illusion that debating is, you know, like very rigorous and 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 um, accountable. I have unfortunately news for you that it isn't. So what do we do in that situation? Some people will say, "What's the problem? It's just a game. It's just a game of logic, right?" This is simply about who makes the most persuasive arguments, who makes the most realistic and intuitive sounding arguments, and they win. And no one really cares about what happens in a debate room because it's almost, you know, like chess. We, we, we have the game and we're done. Like no one is really harmed if I said something wrong about a certain group of people. I used to think this. I think I think my view is now changing as I get older. I, I don't still have a fully formed view. This is actually the first time I'm, I'm giving this lecture. I think my answer to this, isn't it just a game? It's, it's like, not quite. Because the claims that we make in a debate room are a form of knowledge. We're making certain claims to knowledge. We're kind of saying, this is a truth, right? You need to believe me because what I'm saying is true. What I'm saying is correct. I know what I'm talking about. That's part of the quote unquote game, right? Sometimes you have an audience and that audience is listening to debate to the debate and being informed by it, right? And I know we tell our audience, oh, the views of the, the personal views of the debate are not necessarily reflected in what they're saying. They have to, they have no control over the side that they are assigned. That's true. But we also believe that debating is a way of educating people, right? Of exam if so we can't have it both ways. If we if we believe that debate is a way of political education, of examining the multiple sides of the issue, then, then we have to acknowledge the power it holds, right? Um, and so it shapes, of course, not fully. It doesn't mean that you're listening to a debate, you believe everything that's said, but there is still an effect of shaping how we, our opponents, and our judges think about the world. Um, and this happens in my life. Like sometimes when I think about something, the first my starting point is what I've heard about it in a debate, right? Because we do it so many times. It is such an important part of our own lives. So we should, you know, we should be honest about how it shapes the way we view the world, how the arguments we hear in debate rooms actually help kind of help us form opinions about things. And this form of knowledge is power as well, right? Because the way we represent problems or the way in which we speak about people has implications about what interventions become acceptable and what interventions are not, right? Because it, as I was saying earlier, it leads people to um, think of the problem in a certain way and not other ways. So for example, when we use the term third world debt, which is used a lot in debating, right? It kind of frames the problem as the fault of these third world countries. Like, oh, you have like a hierarchy of civilizations and these backward groups of people because they have bad governance and corruption and, you know, they cannot get their acts together and they have like problematic political systems. So maybe they're lazy and they don't pay taxes. And so they amass so much debt. So the problem is localized into those third world countries, right? And uh, the responsibilities of the first world here is just completely erased because the working assumption, when you use that kind of language, when you represent the problem using that kind of language is in some ways like pinning the responsibility on the third world. And I ask, what about first world debt? What about the history of extractive colonialism that left these countries in that situation in the first place? What if? What about predatory creditors? Where do they belong in this debate? And calling something third world debt, I mean, you can problematize it, but you need to be conscious that when, when you use terminology like this, you are framing the problem in a specific way. Or even calling something a refugee crisis, right? What are the implications of calling something a crisis? It seems like it is something that is out of control or in some ways like the fault of the individuals we're talking about. But why do we have this refugee situation in the first place? Like a lot of it is because of structural factors, because also of, you know, certain countries meddling in the affairs of other countries, right? Um, so, but calling it a crisis then kind of makes it seem like we have, like, we should 
we are not morally obliged to deal with it. We can look away, for example, or it's not our fault. It's an exterior problem. So with sex work, which is what this is about, right? Linguistic frames really, really, really matter. And this is like a subject of deep debate and disagreement um, within the feminist community. So sex workers prefer the term sex workers. It makes sense because they want to call attention to the work that they're doing, right? They want to say, look, this is labor, just like any other labor. Um, and so I use sex work, sex worker as a default term in my, in my work. But people who think that sex work is not work, right? They will use the term women in prostitution or individuals in prostitution or prostituted women or sometimes even trafficking victims. And the reason they would prefer to use this term is because they want to make sure that it is clear that they think that they're, that people engaging or people selling sex are, don't have agency, right? They're like, you are in a situation that is beyond your control. You were too poor. You were economically coerced you're desperate, you're a victim of male violence. So it can't possibly be work. It's actually you being prostituted, something being done to you, right? Which sex workers reject. Because sex workers are like, no, no, obviously for precarious workers, all our choices are limited. <laughs> like all of us are working because we need to. That's what, I, what sex workers have in common to some extent with McDonald's workers, especially the more vulnerable ones, at least, right? Um, it's also important to know that sex work is, is very diverse and also has, you know, your high-end sex workers and your more vulnerable ones. Um, so sex workers are like, what are you talking about? You don't go women in McDonald's. <laughs> Why are you doing that to us? Um, and the thing with trafficking and sex work is, of course, there is, so trafficking is very briefly, it's a legal term, actually, and it's, um, you know, it's a technical term. It refers to situations where someone is recruited or hired or transported um, using fraud, deception, um, coercion, force, abuse of their vulnerability for the purpose of exploitation, right? Um, and so some sex workers are like, of course, within the sex industry, there is a small subset of people who are trafficked. That is true also for domestic work. That's also true for agricultural work. That's true for the fishing industry, right? That's true for the construction industry. But that doesn't mean everyone working in that sector is trafficked, right? So that's what sex workers will say. And so they're like, you need to make a distinction between sex worker and trafficking victim. Not all of us are trafficking victims. In fact, most of us are not. I mean, of course, work is exploitative. The capitalist system is exploitative, right? But that's different from trafficking in the way we understand it legally. Of course, some feminists will say, no, all sex work is trafficking, which I obviously disagree with. And sex workers globally will disagree with, right? Um, because for them, there's something about sex that just makes it inherently violent and inherently impossible to consent into as a job. So for them, you know, being a cleaner, scrubbing toilets, um, taking care of kids, uh, being a nail salon attendant, being a masseuse, these are things that are still, or a factory worker are still superior to sex work. And their reason is there's something special about sex, right? And sex workers are like, what? Right. Anyway, so in debates, also like calling specific countries failed states also has implications about how we understand them and what interventions we think are acceptable. Well, if you frame a, a group of countries as a failed state, then it kind of becomes easier to justify intervening an external intervention, right? Because then it means you don't know what's in your interest. Like you, you, you are so bad at running your own country that it collapsed. Therefore, you need external help. Um, or, you know, calling certain, like affixing the label Muslim to terrorists kind of then suggests that if it's a white person or not a Muslim, then they're less likely to commit terrorism, which again, perpetuates Islamophobic tropes. So I don't think what we're doing in debating is neutral. There's no way to be neutral here. We are, debating is political. The language we use in debating is political and we need to embrace that. We need to acknowledge and accept that, right? The other thing that 
you know, is increasingly clear to me is we, we benefit professionally from debates. We, we win trophies. We, you know, we win grants and scholarships and awards. So this is not, this is not nothing. What, our, uh, what are our responsibilities then and to whom and what, right? Okay, now let's talk about knowledge production. What do I mean by knowledge production? I simply mean the process of producing knowledge through a wide range of activities. What are the various activities through which knowledge is produced? There are so many. Um, the classroom, within the family, what parents tell their kids, um, when people publish books, when people uh, you know, talk about something on, on TV or in the radio, um, Instagram influencers are, are producing knowledge as well. Um, so debating, I think, is one place where knowledge is being produced. And I've explained to you why I think that earlier, right? It's not a neutral process. It is shaped by social hierarchies or power hierarchies. And we need to recognize our place in it because we're participating in that, right? And here are some very political questions um, and very, like, you know, power-laden. Like, it's not, these questions are not these processes are not happening outside of power. They are shaped by power relations. Who decides what we should talk about, right? Who makes decisions about what's important enough or not important enough to talk about them? Who are in the room when the conversation happens? Many of us, not all, but many of us probably belong to the middle class, university educated, potentially left-leaning, but not everyone, um, uh, segment of the population, right? Um, there are very few working class debaters because debating is so expensive. Um, so who are in the room when the conversation happens? And, you know, that matters because uh, wh whether we like it or not, our backgrounds, our identities, to some extent have an influence over how we see the world and, and what we choose to argue. So I'll give you an example from the field of economics, right? Um, traditional economics would prioritize things like uh, gross national product, gross domestic product, like very um, quantitative indicators of progress, right? Um, how do we measure, or like initially, how would economists measure uh, productivity? So they talked about the goods that were circulating in the formal market. Um, but what's invisible in that way of looking at productivity? There's an entire like entire um, range of unpaid labor that's being performed in the household. So you someone buys an egg that goes into your computation of the GDP, but what's not in your computation of the GDP is the person who went to the store, who bought it, who cooked it, and who served it. And suddenly feminist economists were like, hang on. The way you measure productivity is problematic. Um, and the way you measure labor is problematic. And the distinction you are making between paid and unpaid labor is problematic because it seems like predominantly women are subsidizing this formal economy because we are giving the worker, usually men at that point, like sustenance, right? We're keeping them alive. We're keeping families alive. We're engaging in social reproduction. And you can't have all these conversations about the formal economy and kind of pretend we don't exist or not count our labor, right? And so now we've developed more expanded uh, metrics for assessing, um, assessing labor and assessing productivity and trying to compensate people for that. But it matters who are in the room when the conversation happens. When you didn't have feminist economics, econ economists in the room and you didn't, and you know the room was mostly, mostly had men, this, did not, this was invisible, right? And so I think we need to recognize that many people are not in the room with us when we are having this conversation. So also, how do we talk about what we talk about, the conventions that we use, like what sounds credible in debates, right? I want to introduce you to a concept called epistemic injustice. And I think it's useful for this talk, but also like for your work in the future. And also when thinking about, you know, social and political issues in general. Basically, it's a, it's a concept I'm borrowing from Miranda Fricker. And I use um, this concept in my own work. 
Epistemic injustice really just means a form of injustice that is related to knowledge. Because we are familiar with forms of injustice that are in some ways more tangible. So we're familiar with, you know, like if, if you physically harm someone, that's a form of injustice. If you take their property, you take their homes, uh, you make them starve, that's a form of injustice. This is speaking about a form of injustice that's related to knowledge, right? Because we just talked about how knowledge is power. So we need to talk about inequalities in, in, in the knowledge system, right? And Fricker talks about two types of epistemic injustice, which is quite important to our discussion of sex workers. The first one is testimonial injustice. So this is how Fricker defines that, right? It's prejudice that causes one to give a deflated level of credibility to a speaker's word based on their identity. So based on your identity, you are seen as less credible in certain conversations. And we see that with sex workers all the time. People are like, you're a sex worker, what do you know? And sometimes you have a lot of like hurtful and harmful generalizations like, oh, you're probably addicted to drugs and that's why you do this. Or you're a bad mother, or perhaps your brain is damaged from all the trauma that you have experienced and you don't really understand you have a false consciousness. You don't really understand what's good for you. Like these are crazy assumptions that people are making and, and very they are forms of injustices because what they what what they do, the function they have is that they serve to exclude people from the conversation. They are not seen as credible authorities, right? Or sometimes when people go, why are we going to listen to this person? They have no university degree. Or why are we going to listen to young people? What do they know? Or or um you know, in job applications, for example, people of certain races or ethnicities are seen as less, less credible when they speak or when someone makes accusations of sexual assault and they are seen as less credible because of their, the, you know, the social markers of their bodies. Like the bottom line is not everyone has access to the same level of credibility when they speak and not everyone is listened to when they speak or not everyone is even allowed the space to speak. And sex workers are one community um, that suffer from epistemic injustice, right? And uh, also within and among sex workers, some sex workers are more heard than others, usually the white wealthy ones, because they exist, right? The more high-end uh, sex work, freelance sex workers. The second form of injustice is called hermeneutical injustice. And Fricker defines this as the injustice of having some significant area of your social experience obscured from collective understanding because of a lack of access to social resources to make sense of one's experiences. So I want to give you an example of the Me Too movement here as a parallel example, right? For the longest time, when women experience assault, or not just women, but individuals experience assault, it's hard for them to realize what's going on or what happened to them. It's hard for them to put a label on it because society doesn't talk about it, right? So you kind of start doubting yourself and you're like, was I the problem here? Did this actually happen? Um, and sometimes you feel like society is actually gaslighting you, right? And the world also doesn't have the tools to understand what's happening to you because these conversations are not mainstream. So your ability to shape the way the world understands your experience, you're unable to contribute to that. And sometimes you yourself are unable to like completely process and make sense of your experience because you don't have a space to meet other people who share this experience and then to build on that knowledge together. Some people might call this consciousness racing, right? So this is where we... Some people dismiss this as, you, oh, they don't know their rights, but it's a little more complicated than that. Like you, if you are criminalized, if you are stigmatized, you, can, you, you don't have access to meeting spaces, you don't have access to support groups, or you know, people just don't talk about the issue because it's embarrassing. Um, then the world won't understand it. And you too will have trouble understanding your own issue. And you are at a disadvantage because you, you can't, you cannot then try to change uh, how people are treating you. It becomes harder for you to inform public policy. There's very little understanding of your situation all around, right? Okay. Here are some of my experiences with sex workers in my collaborative research with them. And what I'm doing with this slide is I'm showing you why it is so hard to get data 
on sex work. Why, when I call them a population that's hard to get to know, right? I'm just establishing that here. So when I initially reached out to the Philippine Sex Workers Collective, their first response to me is, we don't trust academics. We don't trust reporters. We don't trust the NGOs. All you want from us is our data. So they describe this as an extractive process. Like you take and take from us, but nothing, like our lives don't change. Like, you know, our lives don't improve materially. You guys improve. You get your PhDs. You get your awards for reporting on, on, on the situation of sex workers, but we're the same, right? So seeking data, but no accountability, which is fair. And, you know, in some ways, debating is such an extractive practice as well. And that's something I am struggling with through the years. Second is they said, you know, you tend to distort our realities to fit preconceived notions about sex work. So this is a common practice, right? Um, a lot of uh, anti-sex work academics and journalists will, you know, listen to sex workers talk about the, their problems and the violence that they have faced. Fine. But when sex workers are talking about violence, they don't want you to conclude that we should ban sex work. Instead, they are talking about it because they want to show that they need to be given rights as workers so that they'll have control over their working conditions. But some people use the information they give and then fit it into a different conclusion to say, aha, see, you experience violence. This is exactly why we should ban it. And they're like, that's not what we said, you know? So sometimes it's just better to not say anything to you, to withhold this information from you if I know that you are going to warp and distort it anyway, right? Um, another concern that sex workers have about speaking to academics, to students, is concerns about privacy or security. Because some people, I mean, many of them are not out to their families or communities. In some cases, their work is criminalized and they could get arrested. And, you know, some people are very careless with this data. Um, and they release identifying information. Uh, the other thing that sex workers that I was working with had a problem with it. I constantly have to negotiate this because in some ways I am doing this, right? By being here, talking to you about this. They take platforms that belong to us and speak for us, right? Experts like, quote unquote, experts like me suddenly are the ones talking about them instead of them talking about themselves directly. Or what's worse is, you know, other experts who want to end sex work are the ones who are being given the stage and the platform rather than sex workers themselves. They also don't want to work with the police. Most of them don't want to work with the police, right? They also don't like working. The assumption of a lot of people who approach sex workers is we want to help you, we want to save you. So it's coming from a very paternalistic, condescending position. And they're like, we're not objects of pity or compassion. I mean, compassion, yeah, but not pity. And so they're like, we don't need your saving. Take that somewhere else, like, you know. Um, and the other thing that I struggled with the sex work research is, like I said, how does a stigma affect the research process? Um, if you're dealing with a stigmatized community, they don't want to deal with the judgment from the researcher, right? It's very hard for them to look at the researcher and say, oh yeah, I chose this. Sometimes I actually enjoy it and I find it rewarding. It's hard to say that because you're worried that the researcher will judge you. So if you expect the researcher to be coming in, feeling bad for you and trying to save you, then you will just tell them what they want to hear, right? Save you both the trouble. And so you will just say things like, um, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this to support my family. I hate being here. I hate doing this, tears. But that's probably just half of the picture. There might be a, more details in that story. There might be actually moments in their work that they enjoy. They might have actually preferred to do this rather than scrubbing toilets. But they're not going to share that with you unless they trust you and unless they think you're an ally, right? Otherwise, I'm just going to tell you what you want to hear and be done with it. So these are the difficulties of getting data on sex work, but that's a case study, right? That this, similar things have been observed for other counter-cultural or stigmatized communities, for example, like uh, drug users, et cetera, et cetera, but each community will have their own, will have their own nuances, of course. So things to consider when debating about sex work or, simi or similarly hard to know topics, right? 
actually a significant number of university students engage in sex work or know someone who do, but they don't disclose this publicly. So you never know, you could actually be in a social or in a debate with someone who engages in it, maybe not regularly, but who has done it. And so you have to be you know, very careful about what you say or how you represent this. Second is, this one is uh, basically me emphasizing what we've talked about earlier. Sex workers or marginalized groups have had other people speak on their behalf for such a long time, right? They were never really allowed to speak for themselves because of all these forms of epistemic injustice. They were seen as too damaged, too traumatized to understand what is in their best interest. They were not seen as credible actors, right? And a lot of times people speak incorrectly for them. Even when I am making these representations now, I want to be very clear. Like I, I think they're very partial. They're only based on the sex workers I've interacted with. And they're also based on how they presented themselves to me. All of these things are very mediated and partial, right? So when you're talking about group sex, sex workers, there's already yeah, a long history of research and conversations that frame their work incorrectly or that have incomplete information. And then we are joining that conversation, right? We're participating in, this, in these conversations about them in which they have not actually been part. So how can we do better? I can't give you a correct answer here. I'm not going to tell you do not set sex work motions, but here are some guidelines, I guess. And maybe I'll give you some examples of motions that I think even within the sex work community are interesting debates and which ones I would avoid if I were setting, right? Um, because after I laid out this dilemma to you, right, all these ethical questions, does this mean we should only be able to speak about our own communities only? Like, is that the correct way? No. Also, what does it mean to belong to a community? Identity is complicated, right? Like, can white women speak for all women? Uh, you know, if you're university educated, can you speak for your indigenous group? Like, it's it's hard, right? But also, probably not, because that would kill debating. And I don't think I don't think that's a conclusion we're willing to accept. Maybe, maybe someday. I don't know, right? So I think we have to accept that on some level, debating is extractive. And we try to minimize those harms as much as possible. So when you're prepping for debates, my suggestion to you is you check out a wide range of sources. Don't limit yourself to traditional sources. Because remember, we said there are hierarchies in the production of knowledge, right? What we consider to be authoritative is informed by power hierarchies. So don't just read white men, right? Don't just read American authors. Read from a wide range of sources, including blog posts, Twitter posts. So sex work Twitter, for example, there's a lot of really interesting discussions going on. NGO reports, sex worker organizations around the world. There are so many of them and they publish a lot of work. So we should listen and read, right? So we need to, when we're doing research and prepping, have an openness to forms of knowledge that are not familiar to us and formats of knowledge that are not familiar to us. So rather than trying to fit everything into our pre-existing categories, we can be like, all right, I'm open to learning here, right? Pay attention to what the most direct stakeholders have to say. If you're gonna read about sex workers, don't start with a UN report, start with what the sex workers themselves are saying. And there's a lot of information out there. Um, be mindful of your own social location and context, right? So when you're thinking about this, it, it might be easy for you to say, why can't these people just find another job? Um, but you're like, yeah, but, they're, but they don't have the resources you do, right? They don't engage in the, perhaps the same kind of like moral, they might not have the same moral or ethical universe that you do. So be mindful of that as well. When setting topics, so from the CA side, I guess, I think the question you could ask yourself is, is, this inform is information on this issue widely accessible? And in the case of sex work, it's probably not as accessible. I don't think that means you can never talk about it. Will the discussion be productive, right? So otherwise, don't bother. What are the most directly affected groups saying? Are we pretending there are two sides when there aren't? So for me, um, I don't think that the debate on criminalizing sex work is a balanced debate because the effects of it are just so clearly, like the data is out there, the effects of it are just so clearly harmful to sex workers. They get killed, right? It strengthens police power over them. Even the debate about partial criminalization. But there are some other debates. So for example, how sex workers are portrayed in media, 
is some visibility better than no visibility is one possibility. The other thing is, should universities be encouraging, like should they have you know sex work books in their job fairs, which I think is an interesting thing. Another one might be, um, you know, within the sex work community, there's a there's a debate about whether it is helpful to have the stereotype of the happy sex worker, and they, and some of them are like no because you know they are the exception, and we need to make it clear that we are a work we are precarious workers just like everyone else, and the idea of the happy hooker is a myth, right? But some people are like oh no, but the idea of the happy sex worker in some ways is transgressive. It shows that we can change sexual norms. Um, through this activity. And then some people are like, no, that's a very privileged sex worker position. For most of us, it's just a job. That's a real debate, I think, right? So depending on the context of the tournament, how many teams you have, how, how I guess, how experienced the teams are, your knowledge of the pool, those topics sound balanced, right? So I wouldn't say never, never, but the bar should be higher, I think, if you're going to set it. Will it be recorded? Who's likely to come upon this and watch this and be informed by it later on? Will there be an audience? Because that also matters, right? When you are in an actual debate and you encounter the topic of sex work, and this I think is my second to the last slide, just remember that groups are not monolithic. So don't make huge generalizations and say like everyone here is a trafficking victim. Everyone here did not consent to this and is forced or like is being beaten by their manager or clients. Like that's not likely to be the case. In fact, not all sex workers are women. That's important also to keep in mind. Um, avoid portraying groups as having no agency. So avoid language that kind of reduces people to objects, right? Or like to, you know, they might be oppressed. And it's fair to say that they're oppressed. They have no, con they have very little control over their working conditions in some cases, but they're not stupid, right? So don't portray these groups as, oh, they don't know what's in their interest. Like, that's kind of condescending and reinforces all these harmful, all these harmful processes. Because if you perpetuate that idea, then you shut them out of knowledge production again, right? Do not conflate women and children, which happens a lot in these debates, because adult women have a lot more agency than children. Um, also be very wary of reinforcing colonial discourses. The debate on sex work a lot of times usually involves a discussion of race, and that's fair. A discussion of you know, women in military bases, fine. A discussion of, you know, the global sex tourism market, okay. But be very, very careful about how you portray third world women. Again, don't portray them as like passive actors who need to be saved. And who's going to be saving them? The white people, really? Like, how well has that gone, right? So be, be very careful of not reinforcing these discourses in a debate. Um, and, okay, the last thing is, how can we do better? beyond debating, right? Because, you know, debating is a part of our lives, but, and in some, and I think this, this is probably true. Debaters tend to have a higher degree of engagement with social and political issues outside debating. Um, if you have an event in school, for example, consider inviting, and, and when you invite, do compensate them financially, sex worker advocates to speak at lectures and events. Why? Why is that important? Because then it positions them as experts, right? It challenges the idea that they don't know best what policy needs to be done. Like, why do I say compensate? Because what this whole, like, making them talk about their lives is material, uh, sorry, is emotional and intellectual labor, so we should compensate, right? Volunteer for sex worker orgs if your skills match, right? Uh, or even just sharing their, their their posts on social media and just amplifying their voice. We also tend to speak about social and political issues publicly. So be an ally. If, if there have been raids in your community where the police have treated sex workers violently or where they have deported sex workers, you know, from Europe back to their home countries, these are problematic practices. And see what the sex workers are saying about it. Take your lead from them and kind of like, intervene and call people out or like correct this misconception. So there are things we can do outside debating as well to make sure that we are in some ways giving back for how we benefit from, I don't know, deploying people's experiences in a debate round in order to succeed. Is that the perfect solution? No, it's still extractive. But for as long as we want to keep debating, these are probably some ways that we can minimize the extractiveness. 
Okay, I'll end here and I'm excited to see if you have any questions. That's a great question. And I think we accept our own limitations and how we, we're not going to be able to solve this problem, right? So let's accept that. But also, there are some parallel conversations. They are not the same. They are not the same. But where, so for example, I'm trying, I'm, in, I'm seeing more awareness around uh, menstruation, period poverty, and the pink tax. So increasingly, more and more people are talking about how this is kind of unfair. Um, so what I would say is kind of take the lead from what sex worker organizations are saying. And if you are in a position to give them space, give them space, like give them a slot in, in a lecture, include them in a, you know, if there's a women's month series of activities in, in the community, like give them one slot, right? And then ask them, how would you like us to describe your talk? So just try, I, I guess as much as possible, try to, to, to let them the community that we're, we're trying to be allies to, try to let them drive the conversation um, is my short answer to you. But otherwise, it is, it's really hard because a lot of what we can do will be very indirect, right? Um, so in my case, one thing I'm doing in the Philippines is whenever there is a public consultation on anti-trafficking laws or anti-prostitution laws or police policy, I always post where are the sex workers? Why aren't the sex workers invited in these consultations? Or if I am there and if I have any power, because I work in, in the NGO world also, I always say, where are the sex workers? Why are they not in the table with us, right? So use your power where you can, but we're students, so our power is also very limited. I guess if you have professors who are talking about sex work and if they are doing it in a way that's very, you know, stereotypical and kind of misunderstands a lot of these things, which happens, especially with sex work, I have started just speaking up against it and going, actually, that's not what's happening. Here's a wealth of data from sex workers themselves, right? So maybe that's a possibility too. Conversations and we'll stay tuned because uh, in the half in a few minutes we're going to have a workshop with the Achcor of the tournament and then we are going to have the forum for all the participants in the tournament. So stay tuned, stay safe, and thank you everyone again and have a nice afternoon and a good morning I guess for you, Sharmila. <laughs> Peace.